Alright, so I'm going to go over how I scored in the 100th percentile for the MCAT twice. Not once, but twice. So, okay. First of all, I just want to go over this MCAT scores by major. You can see this from, you know, the fact the, the AMC has this information. So, this is also part of the main reason that I emphasize math and number sense. Um, so, let's just look at uh, section by sec section. And I'm focusing only on matriculants, aka the people who not just applied to med school, but actually got into med school. So I'm showing you the scores by major. Apologies, let me exit out of Steam. So for the CP section, math and statistics majors scored the highest, followed by physical sciences that includes physics and chemistry and biochemistry, followed by humanities, which is pretty interesting but makes sense if you consider the fact that the MCAT, like most standardized tests, are passage-based. It's not just rote memorization. You have to understand the, the reading the passage. Then biology majors, biological sciences, and then blah, blah, blah. So yeah, it makes sense to see math and statistics and physical sciences at the top here. It's interesting to see how humanities majors beat out biological science majors. For cars, obviously humanities majors will score highest, but then we have math and statistics majors, which is interesting because math and statistics majors do not ever read passages, but it leads, that's a testament to their ability to think critically. Social sciences also contains lots of reading. It's not surprising to see that up there. Physical sciences as well. Then biological sciences way down there yet again. Bio biological and biochemical sciences section BB. Math and statistics followed by physical sciences, which is equivalent to humanities. And then biological sciences. It's odd to see how biological sciences are in a section or how, how low bio majors score in a section that is based on bio. Psychological, uh, the psych social section, basically social sciences makes sense. Psychology is a social science. Math and statistics and humanities scoring equally. Physical sciences are doing as well as biological sciences there. Total MCAT, math and statistics basically score the highest, followed by humanities, followed by physical sciences, and then GPAs and stuff like that. So I kind of I say some things here. So it seems like math and statistics and physical sciences are the best majors for the MCAT. This makes sense because the MCAT is largely passage based and therefore does not have much of an emphasis on rote memorization, but rather on critical thinking. You will be surprised when you get to the point where you can consistently get correct answers without even knowing the content. That's the approach I generally take because, and that's what makes my approach unorthodox. Um, so I, I just, this is an anecdote, a close friend of mine who is tutoring, who also tutors for the MCAT and has a master's in biochem and certainly knows much more of the material than I do. Uh, yet since this test relies on recognition rather than recall, she would have questions on material that I didn't remember, but I would be able to help her because I knew how to make most of the situation. It's good that you know your bio if you are a bio major, especially with genetics, as that's a huge part of the MCAT. But what I've personally found the most difficulty with, oh, sorry, it, that's what I personally found the most difficulty with. However, once you became, become able to parse through the vast amount of information they throw at you in the passages and attain a point where you can um, read critically, you'll be golden. So I recommend to you to try to take as many uh, sorry, try to make as many interdisciplinary connections as possible. Don't start the CP section closing yourself off to any biology and same with the BB section. Don't close yourself off to any chemistry or physics. There isn't much to memorize, to be honest. I mean, there were certain things that I committed to memory, like shortcuts and tricks, which I'll go over like in a bit, but people spend a lot of time on the math calculations, but if you can learn to do those qu quickly, you'll be at a tremendous advantage. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to go over that. Then I'll go over the spreadsheet I made of all of the MCAT scorers who scored in the 100th percentile from 2018 to 2019. 
their average score on the real test was a fifty-two point five three. My you know my score was a fifty uh, five twenty six. Um, and you can see that on the AAMC tests that their scores are very close to what they scored on the actual test, which is, you know, shouldn't be surprising. The AAMC tests are the closest things to the real test. Um, what I did want to focus on is how they scored on the next step tests because they scored basically like around like 12 points lower than they scored on the actual test and on the AAMC practice tests. So let's see what they actually have to say about uh about the um the next step the next step stuff so basically people are just saying they're definitely harder than the real exam good practice cp had much more calculation based on the actual test and it's much more dense which will still help you prep well cars ignore bb and ps are probably the best third party material for each Good material, good practice, but overall harder than the real thing. Good questions for CP. Difficulty was much more representative of the actual exam. AAMC is way too easy in comparison. That's certainly true. So basically, they're all saying the same thing, and that's exactly what I um, agree with right th there. Um, so, oh, here's an example of what I make for my students, but I wanted to focus on what I did on how I got my score. So, you know, I talk about that here. So this is what I basically did. I did the next step, also known as blueprint full lengths. I skipped cars each time because it's a waste of time. And um, I reviewed it after and made Anki cards for the wrong answers. Uh, the answers, the questions that I got wrong, basically. I did uh, the AMC cars question packs. I didn't finish because it basically started to click for me around two thirds into the first question pack, but this is the best cars material that exists. So that's basically what you're going to be doing for cars. Um, I did the AMC full length entire thing without skipping it, did the same thing, went over it, made Anki decks for the questions that I got wrong and the AMC section banks for each section, CP, BB, and PS. These are pretty hard, but and I didn't take them timed. So you might be asking why skip cars each time for non-AAMC material? Because it's not very similar to the actual test and I saved time by not doing them, which enabled me to do more full lengths in the long run. More full lengths is the key. This is active prep. It builds stamina and time management. It lets you know exactly what you need to know and what you already know. If I had more time, I'd buy Altius tests and do those too. So how did I do on the full lengths? Um, I said this in another video, don't view full lengths as true predictors of your actual exam. <laughs> I make the analogy as to viewing them as Navy SEAL training. Do them with the intent only to survive because you are pro proving to your body through your mind that you can overcome and ignore fatigue. Your full lengths will be deflated that's how it was for me, and that's how it was for the 523 plus, aka 100th percentile scorers. If you feel tired and that you're not ready to commit to the length of full length uh, takes, do it anyway. Do it fast. There's no way to waste a full length. People have this fallacious belief that they're going to waste it, and, by, and they end up not doing enough. Um, I say that there's no way to waste a full length. You do full length because it's the only way to build stamina, intuition, and content recognition rather than recall simultaneously. Um, this part isn't for anyone, everyone. I don't really recommend this, but this is just what I did. Um, I would often do two full lengths in a row. Obviously easier to do if you skip cars like I did, unless it's for the AMC tests. So I would do full lengths when I was sleep deprived. That's also not something I really recommend, but it's something I ended up doing. So how to cope with anxiety and panic. So since I was retaking a 518, I had a very, I had very little margin for error. So this led to me panicking whenever I not know the answer to, the, to a question. What helped me get through this was remembering that the passage is only five questions. That's it. So if something looks scary, just remember to take it question at a t like take it one question at a time. It's only five questions, and you're done with that entire passage. Um, lots of times, scary looking things on the passage won't even be asked about. 
So look at the questions first and think of the question one question, think of the exam one question at a time. That doesn't apply to cars, however. I'll talk about cars in, in another video. So 90% of the passage is utterly useless dribble meant to throw you off and so doubt that you did not study enough. The fact of the matter is you can answer most of everything without the passage by just looking at the answer choices. This of course takes practice to build the right intuition. I recommend flagging liberally. I flag about 15 questions each time. I, I also skip around. So this is my exact test taking strategy. Again, this isn't something I recommend for everyone. Generally speaking with my students, I, they don't really do this, but I do this. So I immediately answer the discrete problems and I know where they are. So from, from doing the practice tests. So I would go to the navigation like button and go exactly to the questions. So for the shortened exam, at least, this is already 12 questions down. So then I start to do the passages. And again, I look at the questions first. Many are de facto discrete questions, so I answer those. And since I'm going at the passages after already having answered 12 of the questions, or maybe like 15 of the questions for the, you know, not the shortened exam, that uh, already boosts my confidence because I am starting passage one, already having done the equivalent of about three passages. So that is just good for, for you know, your, your, your confidence part and attitude. If there are questions that require me to do a more thorough analysis of some graph or chart, I guess randomly and I flag it. If a passage is too overwhelming, I skip it. I do hard passages last because by that point, I have more of the test finished, which gives me confidence. And I lastly go over every question that I flag. I flag anything I'm not 100% certain of. Given that each question is worth the same amount of points, aka one point, and given that the questions range from easy to medium to hard to brutal, it makes no sense to fixate on the harder ones unless you have the time. This is the same for the passages. Not all the passages are created equally. Some are easy, some are medium, some are long and hard. So if you end up getting your first passage being a hard passage, which I've seen countless times on the actual MCAT, not the practice MCATs, um, that's gonna mess up your entire, your, that's gonna mess up your entire flow. You're gonna be freaked out and psyched out just from that first passage when you could spend that time on the easier passages that come later first. Um, so this is something that is more common for people. Like if you, so when the timer is at the halfway point, I aim to have over half of the questions answered. And this is easy if you answer the discrete questions first as they're just basically a quarter of the total questions. It takes practice, but your timing will improve if you allow yourself to be flexible. So, okay, what if the full lengths don't cover the content enough? So everyone talks about content review and it's basically useless. Basically do the content review on a need to know basis. Essentially do full lengths, do section banks. That will teach you, or that will let you know what you do not know in terms of the content and then look do content review on what you don't know. This is an active approach, a proactive approach rather. So basically I use Google image search for quick content review. It's the fastest way to do it because you can find slides and explanations by site. Uh, again, I say videos, lectures, audio, that stuff is way too slow. Um, if I really, really want to have a very in-depth understanding, I recommend these textbooks, Anatomy and Physiology by Kenneth Saladin, Molecular Cell Biology by Harvey Lodish, Biochemistry by Reginald H. Grisham, and Physics by Gian Coley. That's part one of the series. This is the other part. So here I talk about um, I talk about Fermi problems and the importance of doing spending an inordinate amount of time on a small number of problems rather than doing a large number of problems and hand waving or black boxing the reasons why the answers are the are the answers 
Again, elaborative rehearsal, remember? So that being said, I would use Anki. However, I would create my own decks that were primarily composed of the following, math, shortcuts, and tricks, and wrong answer choices. That's how I'd review my full lengths. So here's a card that I used for some math that I memorized. So radical two is 1.4, radical three is 1.7. Log of a number that is less than one aka you know some type of like fraction like that is going to be negative all right now these things you'll see how i make these connections like for instance log of one is equal to zero which is also equal to sine of zero like where theta is equal to zero degrees which is also equal to cosine of 90. log of two and by the way if you, knowing log of two, log of three, log of five, and log of seven enables you to answer any log. More on that later. So log of two is equal to 0.3, which is roughly one third, right? I mean, one third is a little higher. Um, log of three is equal to 0.5, aka one half, which is also sine of 30, which is also sine of six, uh, cosine of 60. Log of five is equal to 0.7, which is also log, or, or also sine of 45 and cosine of 45. Log of 7 is 0.9, which is sine of 60, which is cosine of 30. Log of 10 is 1, which is sine of 90, which is cosine of 0. These are, so fractions are what you should be using. I see people use like some videos by Leah for Psy or something, and they're crap, to be honest, because, yeah, just deal with fractions, because things always cancel out, and it's just completely superior. For instance, know that 1 over 6 is 0.17. No, 1 over 7 is 0.14. No, 1 over 8 is 0.13. It's really like 0.125 or whatever. 1 over 9 is 0.11. Um, 1 over 11 is 0.09. And 1 over 12 is 0.083, which happens to be, and this is what I mean about making connections and being extremely interdisciplinary, happens to be the ideal gas constant when, you know, R, when it's in liters times ATM. So... So I see people, you know, have trouble with the math calculations of the MCAT here on the subreddit so much. And I see the best people often have to offer are videos by Leah for science or something. I don't think those videos are helpful. There's a lot of superior methods to do math and, you know, I'll make more videos about that later. Here's uh, some other kind of, uh, some other kind of things. Like for instance, like any type of um, reciprocal sums, um, you can manipulate First of all, you should be able to manipulate equations and formula algebraically. Like I, not to like be too harsh, but premeds have such a distaste for math that they don't want to do, you know, very basic algebra. But here I'll do it for you. So, you know, if you're doing any reciprocal sum like this, it's essentially going to be equal to the product over the sum. So, you know, here's an example for the equivalent resistance in parallel resistors. Here's an example for, for, you know, the thin lens equation. Here's an example for capacitors, right? Here's an example. I, I talked about this a little bit in the other video. Um, I'll talk about the rest of these in some other video that I'll make about the math. All right. I never memorize all the amino acids because there's no need as long as you can infer how a certain amino acid would, ba would act based on its polarity or charge or lack thereof. So I only memorize the following amino acids, like, like you know, I, I use the analogy of memorize, if you had to memorize the alphabet, memorize the vowels, there are only five vowels. Anything that isn't a vowel, therefore, must be a consonant. So if you memorize the three basic amino acids and the two acidic amino acids, anything that aren't those five would have to be neutral. So yeah, so this is basically what I memorized here. And also like, you know, serin and threonin and stuff, they have an OH group on it. So you should basically be able to infer that it's polar because of what you learned in chemistry. I mean, oxygen is, is, is extremely electronegative. You need to know that stuff because you can memorize every single structure of every single amino acids, every, every single amino acid and still not be able to answer many questions about amino acids if you don't understand them on, you know, in, in such a, in, in that type of conceptual manner. Um, there's some other stuff here that I mentioned having memorized, which are in my Anki deck. 
Uh, so, okay, as for metabolism, I simply refuse to memorize every step. It's pointless and useless. Um, there, is, there are simply too many pathways, and they all intersect, so what I decided to do... And by the way, like, you know, I still, like, w you know, have pretty good content on uh, metabolism. Like, let me show you. Where is it? Content... I guess it's not here. Let me see. Oh yeah, here, metabolism. So like here, here's an excellent example of how in-depth I can be. So this is like basically in the cell and, you know, I'll zoom in some more here. Anyway, this is like, going really in depth into it, but it's it's unnecessary. Only memorize the irreversible metabolic steps and don't even memorize them by rote. Know why a step is irreversible. So like, for example, glycolysis, which someone gave me some something for it because I said glucose one phosphate. But anyway, the purpose of that first irreversible step is to trap glucose in the cell like that first phosphorylation. So it cannot leave the cell because it's phosphorylated, AKA it has a negative charge or rather any charge would make it not be able to get past the cell membrane. Cause you know, cell membrane basically need to be nonpolar to go through it. That this next irreversible step traps it into catabolism because before like fructose six phosphate can enter various pathways that are anabolic. And yes, that last irreversible step is just because the keto version, the tautomer, is uh, less stable than the enol version. But anyway, I'm not going to get too into these types of things. So here are examples of my wrong answer, Anki Dex. So just, you know, basically use that to cut, you know, to shore up the holes in your, in your content review. Anki. So I would make my own decks using closed deletions. If you don't know what these are, it lets you hide parts of your card. This is tremendously efficient as a simple card, like the math shortcut one I posted up top, like this one, right? You can just make that one card and have like dozens of closed deletions, which turns it into the effectively like dozens of cards, right? I could have a uh, closed deletion for each turn, making it, yeah, that's exactly what I said, equivalent to a dozen or so cards. I didn't use any pre-made pre decks, nor did I use any other user's content. Like there's one that people talk about, not because I think that they're bad materials, but because I prefer to make my own at the pace I learn. I also don't think it's useful to have that much content thrown in my face. I know myself and I know I learn best from keeping a low information diet. I would say that content wise, I know far less than the average MCAT test taker. However, I view this as a blessing in disguise because it forced me to use more of my brain. I also chose to memorize different things. I knew that we would have the calculation HC, which is, you know, Planck's constant multiplied by the speed of light in a vacuum. And yes, I'm going to tell you that I do have those memorized just because yes, I was a physics major. Planck's constant is, I believe, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules per second or not joules time second and speed of light in a vacuum is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And when you multiply those, I know that is going to be 20 times 10 to the negative 26 because 6.6 .6 is six and two thirds, which is 20 over three, 20 over three times three in, you know, the speed of light, those cancel. So work with fractions <laughs> like, oh, I talk about it right here. This is just 20 over three and the threes cancel. So, you know, I also memorized RT is 2.5 kilojoules per mole. And yeah, know what the, what a mantissa is. <laughs> so these are some, yeah. So I, I recommend using Anki to speed up your math skills. So I have cards like this, like quickly do log a 30 and log a 16. So I'll just do that for you. Like log a 30 is basically log of three times 10 which is log of three plus log of 10. Um, uh, log of 10 is just basically one. Log of three is basically 0.5. So it's basically just going to be five. 
Log of 16 is going to be basically, you could do this a couple of ways. You could do, I guess, two times, two times, two times, two times two again. <laughs> um, or you could do log of, or, or rather, uh, uh, four squared. And log of four is uh, log of two times two. Log of two times two is log of two plus log of two. Log of two is 0.3. So plus uh, 0 0.3 plus 0 0.3 is 0.6. And then you basically multiply it by two. So you could do it that way. Quick, doubling intensity is the addition of how many uh, decibels. So you're basically going to be doubling the intensity, which gives you a log of two. And you're multiplying it by 10 to get decibels. So that's an addition of three decibels. Quick, put into scientific notation. And also I use E. Don't write out times 10 to the fifth power, write E, five. So put those into scientific notation. Also, this is a good thing. Find pH from, you know, the H plus concentration. So that's just going to be seven minus log of four. And yes, log of four is going to be log of two times two, which is log of two plus log of two, which is 0 0.3 plus 0 0.3, which is 0 0.6. Seven minus 0 0.6, that's going to give you basically uh, 6.4. Anyway, that's enough for now. In